Welcome back to the Azure podcast. Today is the 26th of January in 2022. And today we are on episode 409, talking about service connectors. On Teams with me, we have Kale, Suji, myself, Cynthia, and our very special guest, Xing Shi, who will be talking about Service Connector. And as usual, before we get into the actual topic, we have a couple of different updates to share. Um, Kale, do you want to go first? Sure. I got three things to share here. Uh, the first one is uh, there's a nice blog post up here from our Azure networking folks about the DDoS protection. Um, and what it's talking about is some of the attack trends for uh, in 2021, the Q3, Q4, um, specifically around DDoS uh, type trends that were happening. And it gives a lot of kind of data around, you know, how many attacks were thwarted and all the different things that are going around there, how much bandwidth it took and all that kind of stuff that's there. It also like does talk a little bit about, um, you know, specifically at the protocol level, like how these things were happening. So there's some more detail on that. And then ultimately, you know, talking about the Azure DDoS protection service that we have in team. Um, so it's a nice service if you haven't taken a look at that uh, for your app gateway firewalls and whatnot. Uh, this is a really good tool to help you and kind of bring home the reality of, you know, the bad people that are on the internet uh, attacking things. The second thing is around uh, right sizing, which is a little bit general, but uh, it's something that I've heard a lot of partners and customers like talk to us about, you know, from time to time, because we're pretty in your face about uh, when you're using the Azure portal, about making sure you got the right sizes for stuff, or if you're wasting money on certain things that you shouldn't be. Um, and this is specifically, uh, this article is right around the server capacity and some of the economics around that, looking at how you would kind of analyze that and how you right size VMs, take care of like underutilized instances and then using the Azure advisor, the folks we've had on here before, and some general stuff around Azure reservations and the framework, the well-architected framework that we have. So uh, good thing to take a look at. There's a checklist and some docs up there around cost optimization. Uh, always good to uh, save money. And then the last one I had was around uh, Azure open source days. Uh, I thought it was a funny headline. It says seven reasons of why you should attend the Azure Open Source Day. You shouldn't need any reasons. You should just be going anyway. But uh, <laughs> anyway, it's a uh, it's kind of it's really nice because it basically there's going to be this. Uh, I think it's on February fifteenth, uh, twenty twenty two, uh, from nine to ten thirty uh, Pacific time. So it's not it's not a big uh, like multi day event or anything like that. But a short time to talk about open source, uh, specifically around some key areas that we're investing in in the open source. Obviously, you can think of things like Kubernetes, VS Code, GitHub, all the different things that come around there. But it's free, and uh, feel free to register and join us on the open source day. Thank you, Kale. Suji? Yeah, thanks, uh, Cynthia. Uh, I have a couple over here. One of them was related to our Azure Data Explorer, which is, I think, uh, fast becoming our uh, popular data analytics kind of data lake that we have in Azure. But uh, we wanted to make it a little more accessible to other open source and other tools out there that do data visualization. And Kibana is one of those tools, which has also become very popular these days. Uh, Kibana typically works with something like Elastic uh, Search or the Elastic Stack. And uh, they have created, uh, Microsoft has created a, a, a bridge that can help uh, Kibana uh, look at uh, the data in Azure Data Explorer and, and, and even do visualizations in Kibana. So this way they have one place where they can look at all of their data real estate. So that's, I thought uh, that was a nice update from this past week. And another one is Azure Redis Cache. As you know, Azure Redis Cache requires uh, a storage connection to be able to persist its cache if required, or maybe you preload the cache with data. And uh, typically that storage connection, uh, you know, required you to configure like a connection string or things like that. And now they support managed entity, right? Which is, I think all uh, very slowly, all, almost all services are supporting managed entity. So this way you don't have to worry about configuring those uh, credentials. It just takes the credentials that are set up uh, by Azure when you spin up the service. So those are two of my updates, Cynthia. What about you? 
Thank you. I have a couple to share as well. First is the public preview of Azure Static Web Apps Enterprise Grade Edge. Uh, what that means is that the team has combined the capability of static web app along with front door and CDN so that you have a much more seamless, seamless integration and experience in terms of how quickly your website page loads, um, enhanced security. Also, there's protection against DDoS like what um, Kay was talking about earlier. That's one. The other one that's really exciting is um, also in public preview managed certificate support for API management. So now uh, before you would have to be responsible of taking like a free cert if you have a custom domain or if you purchase a cert, but now that is um, available directly from API management, it allows you to provision, manage, and automatically re renew for you just from the platform. And last but not least, um, the Ultra Disk support for AKS is GA now for uh, workloads that requires high throughput or high IOPS. That's pretty cool on the uh, cert renewal. I know that seems like a small thing, but I remember years it ago, is. that was like a, it would always bite people. Like the site's down, what happened? Oh my God. Uh, we forgot to renew the cert and then there was a scramble to like get it back up again so does that like just pull i don't know if you know this but does it just, like use your azure like payment rails to pay for that or no it's just free it's oh, a free cert that it provisions for you interesting cool but i've been i'm meaning to look a little bit more into it haven't had a chance to yet cool well then I'm going to turn it over to you, Shane. Can you introduce yourself to our listeners and tell us what you do at Microsoft? Sure. First, thank you for having me here. I'm super happy to talk about what I'm doing here. So my name is Shane. I'm the PM from Azure Developer Experience Team. I'm working on a service. Uh, the name is a Service Connector. So Service Connector, the whole idea is to help our developers connect multiple services together. So usually assume you are a developer coming to Azure, you have to you know, choose one of the compute service, could be app service, Spring Cloud, AKS, container apps, uh, depending on what kinds of application and the, the workload you are using right now. And later on for a real application, you have to you know, communicate to uh, like a database, storage, real-time messaging service, so in the past, there were lots of manual steps, lots of address specific, uh, you know, concepts to learn. There is a, a huge learning curve to, to really understand how to connect multiple things together. But now with Service Connector, we are trying to provide a quite intuitive and uh, seamless experience. Basically, if you are using Azure Portal, you, you can just, uh, you know, use a simple wizard to um, answer some questions and get those two things connected. And uh, also we offer CLI experience and uh, you can just run simple command to make the connection happen. So that's that's the whole idea of Service Connector. So Xing, I'm curious, how does this relate or is similar to like what it Logic Apps does, where there are a lot of connectors and you can connect to other Azure services or even like third-party services? Right, yeah, that's that's a really great question. So uh, so for large apps, you know, usually you are doing like low code or no code applications. You just uh, use the connector, you can get a topology uh, of your application. You can easily uh, interact with some of the public APIs, no matter if from uh, first party or third party. But for a service connector, I think we are mainly aimed for those developers who want to have full control of their application code. Uh, usually uh, you have some, you know, more uh, complicated logics uh, handwriting by yourself in your application. And later on, you, you can uh, use service connector to talk to storage, blob, and other uh, address services. So I would say uh, eventually uh, this can be uh, similar things, but uh, that's uh, definitely um, 
uh, you know, we have to uh, learn first what the real things that the goal of developers doing today. If they want to have full control of their code, they should come to service connector to make the connection happen and later consume the data using, uh, you know, using their own application code. Yeah, Shing, so I'm trying to understand, uh, is this uh, some sort of a, uh, like an abstraction layer for, for an app to talk to another app? Uh, I know we all hear about microservices these days and whatnot, and you know there's this concept of a service catalog where you know one microservice needs to know where the other microservices is. Uh, to, uh, the service connector fall somewhere in that category or in that area? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a really great question. So uh, let me first talk about some of the details how service connector works today, and later we can talk about the relationship between like service catalog. So uh, you know, on Azure, if you uh, let, let's assume I'm a developer, I deploy my code, uh, whatever code like a Python Django application to my app service. So I want to uh, let my Django application talk to a database or a storage. In the past, uh, I have to, uh, you know, either turn on mesh identity or like grab the, uh, you know, access key from the target service side and later uh, construct them into a uh, connection string or some endpoint information, put that into the uh, environment or rubble of my application. So that's the first thing you need to do. Second thing, you have to understand the network configuration between two services. So usually you have to configure the firewall settings or you are running all the applications inside a VNet or a, a private link. You have to uh, make it sure you have the policy, the network policy properly set it up and the, your application code running on the app service can actually reach out to those target service we are the network layer. So that's actually involved lots of uh, manual staff. And sometimes developers themselves, they don't have permission to do that. And they, they will spend lots of time to figure out what's the right permission, what's the right, uh, you know, sequence to make that happen. Um, but a service connector, uh, in our experience, you just uh, basically answer two questions. First, what is your, uh, you know, target service instance you want to talk to? You just select uh, in portal. We have experience like a select from drop down list. Just uh, uh, point to that your storage account, uh, and we will know that you are you want to talk to that storage account. And the second question you are answering there is, uh, what's the authentication method between those two things? Uh, by default, we recommend everyone to use Magic Identity because that's the you know the the best practice. But sometimes you probably uh, use your own uh, SDK or a third party SDK that they don't support manage identity. We do have an option that you to use the access key to let's say uh, get the get the data from the blob store uh, blob from the database or blob storage. So by answering those two questions and you can create a connection. Underlying service connector will enable the permission for you to make the connection and also configure the network settings. So if we detect you are using the firewall in your target service, we just put the, the IP of your, uh, your, your, your compute service into the allow list. And if you are using the VNet, we just want to make sure your VNet can be configured properly and you can, your application code can you know, get the data from target service side. That is all about service connector. So I think, um, I think the idea is to really make the experience quite simple. And uh, to answer your question, what's the uh, what's the band, what's the relationship between uh, service catalog? I think that service catalog is super popular kind of uh, you know uh, concept today. And uh, for microservice developers, they can leverage service catalog to browse uh, you know lots of uh, uh, publics or uh, you know private. Uh, service uh, from first party or third party or from their, uh, you know, organizations to uh, leverage that APIs in their uh, code. So uh, I guess for service connector, uh, 
one of the things we are working uh, together, we are envisioning at this moment, it's like uh, uh, besides the full catalog of the things, you in the future with our, uh, you know, we, once we support more and more services, uh, we do can, we, we can have a very intuitive experience let developers to choose one specific service or API from the service catalog. Later on, they can directly leverage service connector to bridge those things together and make that connected to their, their microservice applications. Uh, so I guess that one is still working in progress, but that's definitely one of the, uh, the goal for service connector. We just want to make sure we can meet where developers are and uh, we can support all different types of uh, application framework, application patterns for all Azure developers. And if I uh, you know uh, Kale's got a question, but I want to just ask a far quick follow up. So all the uh, the changes that the service connector are going to make to your environment, your VNets, firewalls, etc. Um, are they kind of audited or does it tell you like, hey, this is these are the changes I'm going to make, right? Or I have to make in your system uh, to make this work. Uh, am I? Is it okay that I do that, right? Is there that that step? Because sometimes, you know, maybe the system administrator is like, oh no, you're not opening up that firewall, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's that's really uh, a interesting scenario. So actually, in real world, the uh, connection can be super complicated because, uh, especially for permission related things, in a real development team or organization, usually. Uh, for developers, they just have a minimal permission, uh, and uh, they are admins control all the all of the things. So to address that issue, we're actually offering a, a dry run API for uh, for our developers for our users. Which means uh, if we go through our wizard to create a connection, in our last page we do have a preview of what things need to be will be uh, you know modified or be changed. Uh, you can get a sense like what things uh, will be applied later once you click the uh, create button. And uh, also in the dry run API, we do have a, a kind of a pre-check functionality to let you know if you have the enough permission, sufficient permission to make the corresponding change. Uh, and uh, again, if you don't have the, those permissions, uh, we will give you some uh, you know, guidance or links uh, help you to get those permissions from your admin or from your organization. Yeah, that was going to be part of my question. Like, I assume there's like access, like RBAC and access control over the service connector feature, right? So admins could say, hey, there's these certain databases and these certain applications and key vaults and stuff that these developers are allowed to build connections to and basically grant them permission. That's what it sounds. So that that's that's what exists, correct? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. The other thing, a question I had when you were speaking here was about a couple things. One was, what about like, is this all in one Azure subscription? Is there like limits there? Like, what if I have another Azure subscription with like my databases in or something like that? How do I, is there a way to bridge over to multiple subscriptions or different resource groups and things? Yeah, I'm glad you raised this question. Actually, if you go in, you, you come to try the service connector, uh, in the first question, what is your target service? The first drop down list is actually your subscription name. So, which means that uh, you can definitely uh, connect to a different database in a different subscription. That's awesome. And then, uh, as you mentioned, on the uh, when they go to apply these things, how do they? Um, I, I did look at service connectors before, and I saw a lot of stuff around like environment variables. So maybe talk me through like a database, for instance. Like typically, if I have an application that wants to talk to a database, as you mentioned, there's like a network layer, but then there's also like app level stuff. Like, well, which database am I actually going to talk to on this database server? So how does all that stuff get reflected? If I say, yeah, let's go ahead and connect these two. Is that part of the wizard? Like it asked you, like which database or even tables or something you're going to talk to and then how does that get reflected back in the app is it environment variables or like something else for the developer right yeah so that's actually a common scenario especially to a database connection usually uh, developers may have different applications that actually talking to different specific database in their database service 
So in our wizard, uh, the first question, uh, as I mentioned, we are asking developers, which is your uh, target service instance you are connecting to? Uh, in in the in that question, we offer several drop down lists, like the uh, first one, the subscription name, second one, your uh, target service name. In database case, once you choose the, let's say, uh, MySQL data, uh, MySQL uh, Flexo server, uh, we will have a new uh, drop down list showing just uh, uh, you know under that uh, led you to choose from the different database uh, so that uh, after you go through the wizard make the connection we will we will generate the co co connection stream for you so in the connection stream there is definitely your section you know uh, you know talking about uh, saying that that's the uh, database you just selected in the wizard uh, so another thing you just remind me is like, uh, especially for database developers, sometimes they they uh, store the connection stream, the pool connection stream or the uh, the access key in the environment variable. But sometimes uh, we do recommend developers using like C, uh, key vault to store those things. So we are actually uh, working on a new feature which will be released very soon. Uh, let you, we have a checkbox in the wizard let developers to, you know, um, directly put those access key or connection string in their uh, key vault so that they can get the, you know, the secured by default. That is, that is, that is really good to hear. Thank you for, for putting that request in. Uh, I, I was wondering, like, you know, how do you undo some of these connections? Let's say tomorrow you say, oh, you know, I don't really need that database, right? Uh, how do I kind of undo some of the service uh, connections that were made before? Right, yeah, that's that's a really interesting scenario. I guess uh, for now, it's hard uh, for, from our, our perspective, uh, it's super hard to undo a uh, operation, right? Uh, it's not like a transaction contains many steps. The, 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 those, those configurations might be changed or might be uh, you know, reused by other other applications or by someone else in the in the development team. So what we are offering today is like uh, you can definitely delete a uh, connection, and uh, uh, we you can just remove the record of the uh, environment variable or the uh, the the secret uh, from that. But the, uh, as I mentioned, the connection involves lots of complicated uh, configurations. We do provide a, a list of the things, uh, let you know that those things we tried our best to, to you know, get it back to you, uh, get, to make the change, to to delay the, the configuration, but uh, we need your help to double check, to manually check uh, if these are properly set it up, uh, uh, if you really want to clean up everything. I guess they could always go back and look at that original uh, list of changes that you make and and and, and see like okay you know what do, what do we have to put back in place uh, over there right yeah yep. okay. along with that it like it kind of goes along with what Sajit was saying like from a policy perspective if the enterprise has certain like uh, standards you know for like how applications should talk to each other and things like that it sounds like in this tool, as you mentioned, like the checkbox thing for the key vault thing, there's some options there. Obviously, it feels like the policies would still apply, right? So if they try to do something that's not allowed by the enterprise, it just won't happen. Uh, but is there like any integration there? Are you thinking about that from a policy perspective, like to help the developer say, oh, well, in your environment, it's really locked down. So you always have to use like key vault or you always have to use these certain things, you know? Right, yeah, that's definitely a scenario we, we heard from customer and uh, we are talking to the other policy team to make that happen. So the thing is like uh, we just uh, respect the policy, uh, you know, the, the development team or the organization already set up and reflect those changes in our UI and the guide developers to make the connection. How should we think about these service connector resources? Like, are they tied to a region? Is it, do we think of it as a pass resource? <laughs> and then if it does tie to the region, then what happens if my compute and my databases are in different regions? What matters? 
more, I guess, is it the compute or is it the database? Right, yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question. We, we spend a lot of time, lot of time debating how we design the connection resource. It's like a conceptual, uh, you know, resource on Azure. It's quite different, like, uh, you know, comparing to app service or database. You know it is when you talk about those results, but the connection, what is a connection? So from technical perspective, uh, so far uh, we are we build service connector connections as a uh, extension uh, resource provider, which means uh, that resource need to be attached to a compute resource. So if you're thinking about uh, a connection, usually it starts uh, with a compute. You host your application code there, and your application code consume those conceptual connection talking to different types of, uh, uh, you know, database storage, real-time services. And, uh, uh, and uh, speaking of the region, uh, actually, uh, we are, we are, uh, we, when you create a connection, your connection, conceptual connection resource is, will, will be actually located in the same region as your compute resource. Uh, which means uh, you have a uh, same uh, like data resiliency, data latency in the same region, and you are if you try to move your compute service to another compute service uh, to another region, your connection will uh, you know you will be moved together. So that's the the design we are doing. But one of the limitation in the preview is uh, unfortunately we just support very limited region at this moment. And uh, we are we do uh, have a plan to expand into more regions so that uh, in the future, no matter your what what computer resource you are using, what regions you are deploying to, you can get benefits of the service connector. And the question Cynthia asked uh, was uh, led me to believe uh, to ask another question, which is. Is, does it generate some sort of our ARM template or something at the end of it? Like, is there is like a, an artifact that I can say, oh, you know, if we have to start all over again, right? Uh, just, just, just replay this file and all the connections will be remade, right? Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, just something to uh, like, like, like almost like a, a desired state file, you know, of speak of sorts. Uh, yes, right. So given we are an extension resource provider, we de developers or DevOps, they can definitely, uh, you know, uh, use ARM um, template or BICEP to describe their connections between their compute and target. So in the past, uh, if you want to make it connect, uh, make the connection correct in the ARM um, template or BICEP, there are lots of uh, uh, sections you need to manually check. The network in a different section, Environment variable in a in a in the under the com compute RP section, and uh, you have to uh, change some policy for all the the whole application. But for now, uh, we we do have a uh, we do have our schema in uh, BICEP or ARM. Uh, you just uh, uh, simply answer those two questions in in ARM or BICEP flavor. You can uh, create a new deployment. And you can uh, get the, those connection uh, seen up in uh, attached to your compute service. Yeah, I I got I got to tell you, I mean, I I'm a developer, and I don't know how I've never heard of this service before. <laughs> the feature <laughs> before <laughs> we have to get this uh, out there, the word out there that this feature exists, because I think developers would benefit a lot uh, from it. Uh, thank you for uh, explaining that to us today. Uh, Cynthia, back to you. I have the question about a uh, disaster recovery. So uh, you said um, these service connectors are kind of attached to the compute resources. So say if I had like availability zones enabled, does it translate for the service connectors as well? Or do I have to do something different? It is. Uh, so uh, we do have a uh, availability zone support, which means, uh, you know, the connection uh, will be uh, if you are you, you deploy your app service or your compute service in an availability zone, uh, our uh, our service connector, the conceptual connection resource you create will also be 
apply to the same availability zone. So basically, uh, you get the benefits from the availability zone for both of the service side. And uh, uh, that also raises another interesting scenario usually happened in the connection. Uh, you know, the connection, I would say, super fragile, which means uh, um, <laughs> lots of things need can be changed uh, during your daily development, or uh, even you uh, you have a stable version production application running uh, on the cloud, uh, someone will in the team perhaps accidentally uh, change some of the configurations. Some some of the target service like database somehow it's not available, or uh, you know sometimes it perhaps after six months due to your company policy. The access key has been refreshed, it's filed, something like that. And the in service connector, we do have a button to let you to, you know, validate the connection or troubleshoot the connections. So basically, we will uh, go through all the possible things that can lead to, uh, to the issues, and uh, we will show uh, the corresponding, uh, you know, the guidance or troubleshooting uh, steps for you to let you to fix the connection. Uh, yeah, that's uh, basically we just want to make sure it's super easy for developers to uh, to create a connection and to maintain the connection and to use those connection in their production environment. Yeah, it sounds like a good troubleshooting tool too, right? If I just want to know like, oh, why can't I connect to the storage account? <laughs> like right. a little health probe. Yeah, exactly. You can uh, create a connection here and you can uh, click the validate button. You will see all the details. Awesome. <clears throat> any any more questions, Suji, for Xing before we let him go? Uh, just, uh, we know, uh, how do they, what, what, like, uh, how should uh, developers get started on this? Uh, is it, uh, if you have an existing, uh, infra uh, you know, architecture or uh, application in Azure, uh, should you know? Sh can you can you introduce it there, or does it have to be starting from scratch? Like, what's the best approach to get going on this? Right. So for for new apps or existing apps, you can always go to either port and you will see a new uh, service connector node in the left table of contents. There, you just click that node, you will see our page. You can try our features there. Feel free to try and let us know. Uh, also, uh, for existing apps, um, you probably uh, already manually set it up, uh, set lots of connections ready for, for your application and been running for a while. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have a path for you to convert those things into the conceptual connection we are maintaining today, but uh, uh, I would say stay, stay tuned. Uh, eventually, we will have something for that and uh, you can get all the benefits from the features we are building. Thank you. That's it, uh, Cynthia. Uh, thank you so much for all those answers. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, thanks for coming on, Xing. It's, it's been really eye-opening for all of us to learn a little bit more about this service. Thanks. Thank you.